a screen now. Um, so, yes, over to you, Sue. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, first of all, hello, everyone. Um, it was fabulous to see how many different people there are from all over the world. So um, really, really delighted to be here. A um, uh, little bit about me, um, and I won't go on too much, um, but I'm a certified data analyst. Um, I have my own consultancy business um, and I've been working with Power BI for um, works commit for six years now, but before that I sort of fell in love with Excel and access and data and um, many, many years ago. And, and I, I just love the insights that data gives to business and supporting business to make the right decisions for them. Uh, oh, th that's my LinkedIn and that's my Twitter. So by all means, reach out and connect. I do tend to share quite a lot of information that I see, so um, it can be quite useful. So today's session, and I'll make sure I finish on time so you, you can get a comfort break before the next one. Um, you'll be able to understand and recognise some of the key basic concepts behind different types of data. Um, we'll understand the importance of data types. They are two different things. Um, we'll learn how to effectively model data, so following on from Anna's excellent session just now. And then we'll understand what is meant by normalised data, because as you start working with Power BI, you'll, you'll hear these terms. We'll talk a little bit about why a star schema is so important. Um, I'll, I'll explain how the Vertipack engine within Power BI works. So just this is how we're going to start. Uh, so we'll go into our definitions. So when we start looking at data, there are different um, there are different types of uh, data that we start to look at. And I've categorized them into three main areas, numeric, categorical and time series. So what do we mean by this? So numeric um, is basically grouped into discrete and continuous data. Um, so it's things, it's money that you count. Um, and what we actually say is this represents some of the facts and it's a quantitative type of data. So it allows you to actually say, what's the quantity? How many sales did I make? Um, how many views did I have? How many clicks did I have? It's, it's a quantitative, it's a fact and discrete and continuous data. So when we start looking at discrete, discrete is things like money, whereas continuous can be a range of data. So we're actually looking at things like um, a percentage, which can be, you know, 89.9999% percent whereas a discrete will be money, it will either be um, £5 or £5.50, it's, it's an exact figure. Um, the opposite of, uh, or the opposite or uh, another part of data that we start looking at is our numeric and our, um, our categorical data. So this allows us to tell stories and quite often you'll see people talk about the art of storytelling with, within data. And that allows us to actually make meaning of these numbers. So we can say, you know, you spent the business created 500 pounds of turnover. Well, that's great. That gives us a quantity of actual measurement. But is that good? Is it bad? Um, and the categorical allows us to have um, a meaning. What's the story? you know, compared to this year or last year in, in which area of the business. So this allows the meaning to be generated from the numbers. So this is our qualitative data and you'll, you'll see that quantitative qualitative. So within categorical data, you'll find that there's two types in the same way that we had discrete and we had continuous. We have nominal and we have ordinal data. So within that, we will have hair colour. Hair colour, for example, has absolutely no order. Um, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's just a colour and that colour has no order. 
that ordinal data has an order. So something like a job hierarchy would have an order in which you would want to present that data. And then when you start working within Power BI, it's the order that actually has, um, that you want to think about how to sort your data. And a key example of this would be months of a year because they're not alphabetical, but they come in in a certain month of the year. And um, within here, this starts to become important when we start actually um, visualising our data. So when we put our data on our, um, and there's questions coming up for you all shortly, um, when we start actually looking at our data in charts, we want to have um, our values here in the middle, but then along our axes, we have our different types of data. So what data do you think, and I can see the chat, so what data do you think would be along here? Type it in if you can think about it. So along here, would it be categorical or would it be um, ordinal? So it would be age, yep, it's age, but is it a specific age? So it's grouped. Yeah, so it's a category, but it's a continuous range. We can perfect range. It makes me feel better when you chat and you answer questions because I don't feel quite so much on my own. Um, so it's an age range. We've actually grouped the numbers of, of telling us our categorical our age, which is a continuous into a group. And along here we have a distinct because we will have a certain number of people that are on that age group. Pick back on here. So this is discrete because there will only be a certain number of people at that age, and this is continuous because it's a range. So along here on our x axes, and I always remember this because when I was at school, the y axis was y to the sky. So along here, what would this be? Oh, screen shares off. Can you see? Let me turn it off and on again. You see now? Hi, Sue. It's just a black. There you go. It's back. Thank you, Sue. Lovely. Thank you. You see? OK. Yep. Perfect. Still see? Cool. Thank you. So along here, we have categorical and that's the X axis and we have our Y axis along here. And it, this is quite useful when you start visualizing the data and you're telling your story. So it's about thinking where it is. So discrete and categorical. And then we have our lovely little waterfall chart. So again, this is telling us our story. It's our categorical data. And then we've got a discrete amount going at the top. So time series, times so we've talked about numeric and we've talked about categorical. So time series, we normally have our time along the bottom. And this is just a GIF that was created from within Power BI. And it's a way to show real time data. So we have our values going at the top up on our Y axis, and then we have our, our data going along. And again, another one where we start looking at our sales amount, where we have our dates along the bottom and then our values at the top. So it's a really nice, clear way in which you can actually see your data. And, and this, um, yeah, yeah I, I can agree with that. I've got three sons, they, they drive me nuts in a nice way. So here in our, our data modelling, um, this is Excel. So when we look at Excel, we have our facts or in our values. So this is this goes back to Anna's session where she talks about dimensions and facts. Dimensions are our categorical data. So our dimensions sit in our filters and our columns and the row name, which gives us the context. The values are total cost. These are our measures. Our measures sit in our values. So 
this gives you an idea of how to actually place. This is what our story is about. This is how we're filtering our data. And all of these are actually showing us. So we have our filters along here. We're filtering by each quarter. We're filtering by each month. And then at the top, we've got the filter on the year. And these are our values. So I've mentioned briefly the different types of how we would categorize our data into numeric, categorical and time series. So when we start looking at data, I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about structured and unstructured. So you might ask what the difference is. So structured data, which probably the majority of people on this course will be um, working with, is predefined models. It's things that are easy to search. So it might be coming from your CRM system, or it might be coming from um, any type of API that you pull from some software. It could be coming from many, many different Excel sheets or CSV downloads, and this is very much structured data. Unstructured data um, can be things like um, text, lots and lots of text, which is coming from emails. So you might have to analyze subject matter with an email or surveillance um, footage. And that's that's still data and that still gives us um, information, but it's in a very different type of format. So just quickly, question for you. Um, what percentage of data do you think is unstructured? Roughly. Make sure you're still there and awake with me. 90, Rob? Yeah. 80%. Yeah. Yeah, Vijesh, you're, you're, you're um, a little bit lower. 99. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes that way. Um, according to Gartner, and this is a couple of years old, it was about 80%. Um, or enterprise data was unstructured. But I suspect that now if we were to analyse it, it would be near a 90. So the difference between structured and unstructured data. So structured data can be displayed in rows and columns. So when you think of your typical Excel spreadsheet, it's usually numbers, dates and strings. And string by strings, I mean text. It requires less storage because it can be compressed in order. Um, and it's usually easier to manage, whereas when you start looking at unstructured data, it requires a lot more storage and it can't necessarily be displayed in rows and columns. And this is where you start using some of the um, more specific type of data um, science type uh, software. So this. I'm sure you've seen all and this is just an example. You've seen lots and lots of um, Excel spreadsheets that looks like this. So this is structured data. We have along here each month, we have a total, we have a percentage and we have our category, our categorical data here. So we've got what type of bill it is and we've got what the month is. So although this is structured and we can pull it into Power BI or we can pull it into Excel if you're using Excel for your management or we can pull it into R, is actually not in a format or Python. It's not in a format that we would necessarily use for data modeling. So again, this is another example, and I'm using the word tidy here. I like this word and I'll, I'll show you where it comes from. So it, it makes sense to us as human beings. We've got our months along here. We've got our category for our expense items. We've got our category for our expense category, but it's really difficult to see what's happening. You know, it's just lots and lots of text, but it is structured, but not tidy. And this is the holy grail of what we're trying to achieve when we work with Power BI or we work with Excel or when we start to use any data analytical tool. We need to have a tidy data set and a tidy data set is a term Kirk, um, that I picked up when looking at R and I just thought it's just perfect. So a tidy data set is where each column has the same thing. It's the same variable. So here, we have the transaction date, and that is the date that the transaction happened. Nothing else is in that column. That column just contains this. In the account, 
this account is the name of the account that the transaction belongs to. And even though it's a number, it's still a categorical piece of data because we're not going to add this up or divide it. We, it it's, it's showing us it could be a name. So although it's a number, it's actually a name. And the same with department. The department 150 is actually standing for a specific department. It has no numerical meaning at all. And then we have our, our amount. So this is how much is, is um, has been spent on that day for that account for that department. So each column is a specific thing. Each row is an observation that happened. There's no grouping there. And each cell contains one single value. There's no commas. There's no 61510 is 26 pounds and 33 pounds and something. There's one amount. So there's one single amount. And this is what we call a tidy data set. And it's it's probably what you will spend the majority of your life doing is taking messy data and transferring it into this tidy data set. Unless you work for a really big business that has an excellent um, excellent uh, IT department that, that does this for you. Um, but most of the time, I probably spend about 80% of my time taking messy data and putting it into this format. Fortunately, I really like it, so it doesn't matter. So this is a tidy data set. We have here, each column is a variable, each row is a unit, and each cell is an individual unit. And what you'll find is that a tidy data set is a lot longer and less wide. So if you've got, if you think of, you know, you, and, you know, I've seen it where you, your Excel goes up to DW, whatever, you know, that's really, really wide. And Power BI, it, it much prefers columns small columns, lots of rows. So your fact table can be really long, but it, it should be narrow. Try and keep the, the um, columns as, as narrow. So it doesn't really matter how long it goes as long as it's in this data set. So why, why is this important? So here we go, we're showing the order date. The date here is unpivoted. And so we've actually unpivoted so that the date is in that one particular column. Doesn't matter which month it is, doesn't matter which year it is, we can group and aggregate that by pivoting it, but the date is unpivoted. So this is also important for a couple of reasons. It, it, it gives Power BI the, um, the data in a format that works, which I'll explain in a little bit, but it also allows us to do different things to our data. So here, going back to this expense, this expense item is a text field. This expense category is also a text field. This date category is also a date. It's not also, it's a date. And this is a decimal number. Now, why is this important? Why does it matter? Any thoughts why it matters? And I've done this before, working with dates primarily. So why does it matter? Anyone? No? Text columns have it? Yes, thank you. I thought, oh my goodness, had it? Yeah. So why does it matter? Thank you, Arvind. Yeah, it helps to model the data. It just makes me feel less alone. I think I worry then and think, oh my goodness. So the question is, why does it matter what type of data type our columns are? Yeah, compression helps, Christian. So to get to this, the data has to be in that format, but yeah, it does. Model performance can be um, for optimal model performance. But also, if you look at this, this is grouping and we've sorted it by um, C of cost. And then we've got it sorted there by alphabetical order. Here, we're summing it up. And here, we're creating a percentage. 
Now, the only way we can do this is because we're able to do things to our data. So within our data, we have different data types. We have strings, which are text. We have integers and whole numbers. And if you store something as a whole number, yeah, cleaning the data, Simbashi, you're, you're nearly all right. If we store things as a whole number, it takes up less space. We have decimal numbers. We have Booleans, true, false, yes, no. We can have array, which is a sort of like, um, you, you'll see them in Power Query. It's like the square brackets where you have different fields within that you can then open up. We have currency. We have nulls, blanks, not applicable, no data, and we have dates. Now, the difference is when we have these, and I'm just going to swap to Power BI practice model. So this I can give you, it's a, there aren't any visuals on it, but the data set I can give to you. So this is basically a dimension table. It's our products. So it has on here a number for each product and you can see it's distinct and unique. So what that means, and this is really useful, and you get this by clicking on view and open up column distribution, column profile and column quality. And what this is showing me is this is my primary key going back to Anna's point. I can use this. There are 30 distinct values and they're all unique. They're not duplicates. You can't use this if it's a duplicate, but it's a number. Now, if I right click on it and I click on transform, this will show me some of the things that I can do to a number. So a number is a particular type of data and that particular type of data has things that we can do to it. So we can add it, we can round it, we can divide it. Um, we can do all sorts of things to a numerical type of data. If we look at our text and click on transform, and these are just the shortcut ones, we can create lowercase. You can see that what you can do to a text field is very different to what you can do to a number field. Um, these, this is why it's important that you have one thing in your column and it's the same thing, because when you want to apply your data transformations, you will only be able to apply text transformations to a text field, number transformations to a number field, date transformations to a date field. And this is, and quite often this can be where some of the problems come when you're actually trying to clean and transform data is that someone might have written in, um, instead of 30 as a number, they might have written in 30 in text, or instead of writing in um, a date in the correct format, they might have written January. And when you have that, that, that can trip Power BI up because you might think, right, OK, this is a date, so I want to pull out all of the years. It will only pull out all of the years if every single item within that column is a date item. So this is why it's critical to make sure that every column goes back to this tidy data set where it has a name, it has a specific data type, and it's a specific thing. And it's only one value because you're doing the same thing to everything in that particular column. So you'll see this is my dimension table and it's you look down here and you can see there's 30 unique. There's 30 of them. Minimum is product one. Maximum is product nine. Now, if I go on to my sales, you'll see that sales is a lot longer. Currently, column profiling is based on the top 1000 rows. And if you get, so if we look at here, order date, you can tell it's a date because everything has been shipped to the right. And if we look at our transformations, you can see we can pull out the year, start of year, end of year, the quarter, the month, the week, the day. All of these are different transformations because it's a date. This particular field has date attributes, which means that we can we can do date things to it. 
Um, so we've looked at text, we've looked at dates. Um, this customer name index is currently stored as text, but it, you know it's it's not really hugely significant in this case. Channel um, and warehouse code. And so depending upon how you choose to store your data will have an impact upon the different things that you can then do to it. Um, so when we start looking at dates, we can see here you have your dates. There's a thousand distinct, a thousand unique. A little, uh, a little trick. If you've you've done this and it all looks perfect, and then you publish it and it comes back with an error, check your column profiling because Power BI looks at the first of thousand rows. So if it's still coming up with a date and you're thinking, well, but all my dates are OK, there's no errors, I don't understand. Try doing your column profiling on the entire data set. And then what you'll see is this, in this case, there's 2,343, if I click on it. And you can see then, I can make sure there's still no errors, but sometimes you'll have an error in some data that you've pulled in that isn't in that top 1000. So it's always worth checking on that. Um, and the other little thing I want to point out is, you see these three dots here, these th three dots allow you to group by. So in this case, I could group by month and it would show me the month distribution of what I have in, in the column. And this is really important in understanding what you're looking at when you try to build your model, because if your data is not right and your model's not right, your DAX becomes really difficult. And so it's worth really thinking about getting your data clean, getting it tidy, and then considering the modeling. So there's that. Um, and so we've got customers, which is another dimension table. So I've got one, two, three, four dimension tables and one fact table. Um, the other thing I want to, can you do that group by one more time? Yes. So if I click here, and so what I've got on view, I've got column distribution, column profile and column quality highlighted. And what you have to do, these, you have to have your data type set up. So if I look on order date, you see here, it's got the three dots. If you click on those three dots, you can do group by. So I could do group by month. Nice. So that was Melissa de Kong who showed me that on, she's got an enterprise DNA course, which is just absolute genius. Um, so that allows you to group by different things. So we could group by year, but there's only one year. But it allows you really, really quickly to understand what's happening with your, yes, our binge, you can have multiple fact tables. I'll go on to that in a minute. And definitely you should have multiple fact tables. Um, this is the other thing that I wanted to share with you. So when we're talking about the fact that you have different data types, um, yeah, me, me too, Siobhan. Um, different data types here. If you click on source, if you do a new query, so home new query and you type in equals hashtag shared, it will come up with the entire M library. So convert it to a table. So when you're here, convert into a table. Now, because M is a functional language, what I've been able to do is write table select rows, and then I'm referring to T shared, and I'm just saying, show me everything that starts with a text. So this then shows me everything that I can do to a text column. So the key with Power BI is it's columns, whereas in Excel, you've got lots of cells. So you might think, well, I want to know um, the position of. So if you click here, there's the different function. If you click in it, not on it, it will then show you the text function. So, you know, how I can find the position of some text or how I want to split. And these are all the things that you can do to a text column. So if we then go back, what I've done, 
table selector is t-shared because I'm skipping text functions. I'm pulling back in t-shared text that starts with a table. So this shows me everything I can do with a table. And I'll give you this, but this again, all this is Melissa's work, not mine. So the same list functions. I can look here and I've got all of the different functions within um, that I can use. Date functions. So this is why dates are, are the most tricky thing, I think. So you really need to make sure your dates are correct. So you can say date is in the next n months. So if you're looking for something forward to see is date in the next few months, there's a piece of code for it. As long as your column is in a date format. And we have the same for logical functions and we have the same for number functions. But all of these works because they're attributes of numbers, which goes back to my lovely little ID data set. Because each column is a variable, each row is an observation and each cell is an individual unit. And that's why um, that's why we actually have this. Any questions at this point before I, I move on? Get back to my power query. Why we select the name column? Because that's just the name that's holding the function. It's um, it's it's a, you could call it anything, but that's the name of the um, the different functions that happen. So when we look at when we look at this, this is our basic data model, really nice, tidy data model. Everything set in the right format. Is there a way to profile? Not yet. So down here, column profiling based on top of thousand rows. If you click on it, you can you can um, click on column based on entire data set. Yeah, to get the shared table. Uh, I just want the new query, new query. So what I did, right click, new query, blank query. And then in my blank query equals hash type shared. Oh, might help if I put the A in. Equals hashtag shared. It's that simple. Convert to a table. So I'll share I'll share this with you, but um, in advanced editor. Copy it in from there. Uh, not sure why you can't see it on yours. Don't know, but it it's there. So I'm just going to delete that. So once you're happy and you've gone through and you've made sure there's no errors, every single table is in a really nice, clean data set. Close and apply. Let me go back. And we then set up our relationships. So on here, we've got our sales data. So the shared query is showing you basically what you can do to every type of column, depending upon its data type. So on here we have our regions, our products, our customers and dates. These are our dimension tables. And basically what these do is these filter the rows on our fact table. So if we click on regions, you can see that the index in the um, region index table is filtering our delivery region index. So anytime you pick a country, it will filter this table to only show you those rows that belong to that country. And the same with products, the same with customers and the same with dates. They're basically filtering. So your dimension tables filter your fact tables. And that allows you to set up your data model. There's no many to many. They're all going downhill. 
So they're all filtering down. And this is this is the best way that you can have. And this is what it's called a star schema. It's sometimes called a star schema because people have it set up like this. So it looks like a star. Um, you know, that's one way to do it. Personally, I like it like this because it really pulls down the fact that it's a one to many relationship. The information in this table filters this particular. Um, yes, it has, Jose. I do all of my data transformations through Power Query. It's incredibly, incredibly um, user friendly and, and strong. So all of the data in the dimension tables is acting as a filter on your fact table. And if you want to check some of your measures and you want to see if things are working, then you can go to your sales. And if we wanted to filter by, I don't know, uh, customer name index, you can sort here and we could just say 109. And then we could say warehouse code. And this is all your slices are doing or all or all your attributes are doing in our in our columns. So we would have our warehouse code and our customer name index. And this is what your dimension tables are doing. They're filtering your fact table. And the way that they do that is by having your primary key and your foreign key set up. So just to go back to and also this can be done in Excel. So although I'm showing you this in um, Power, Power BI, there is absolutely no reason at all that it, it can't be done in Excel. Um, the engine behind Power BI and Excel works exactly the same. So um, import definitely Tina, unless you really can't get away with it, but definitely import is quicker. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. So going back to my presentation, because I just want to so here, just to just to reiterate, we have our fact tables at the top, which I'm sorry, our dimension tables at the top, which are filtering down to our fact tables, which are here. So what we're doing within Power BI is we're filtering to say all our slices, all our axes, all our table rows, our table column headers, they're all filters. They're filtering our, our, our fact table. Then what we're doing is we're grouping them. So we're grouping them by month, or we could be grouping them by customer name. Um, and then we're creating expression, we're creating our DAX, where we might be summing them up, or we might be dividing, or we might be showing a percentage. Someone asked about two fact tables. Yes, definitely, you have many fact tables. But what you have to make sure of is that what you filter on is exactly the same. So you have the same date. So this is where you can filter by different dates. So you have a date in each one. Or if you're filtering by a particular product, that product is called the same thing in each fact table. Otherwise, you can't actually um, you can't actually filter. So it has to be filtered by the same. So if you want to see how many apples you've sold, they have to be called apples in both fact tables to be able to filter by apple. And that that's one of the key things that you, you want to think about is when you have your your dimension tables to be able to cross filter fact tables, you have to be um, you have to be filtering by the same thing. So this is probably the most complex bit, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it's the bit that really blew my mind when, um, yeah, your facts can't be connected to each other, but the dimension that you're filtering them by has to be the same in each fact table. If you if you come from a database background, in databases, the, the key thing that you're looking for is, is called 3NF. Um, which is called um, third normalization form. And third normalization form is where you break it down even further. So within um, Power BI, we might have a, um, a location table and we could have um, Australia and then we could have the territory and then we could have the code all in one table, which is relating to 
location and we have repeating values which doesn't matter to power bi and i'll explain why in a moment whereas if you're in databases databases are built to store data not to do the same level of reporting um not to do the same level of reporting that power bi does so databases break it down much more into each table has one unique thing in it so for example for clients instead of having client id city state clients you can't do client id they might have city id and then within so it's much more numbers orientated which is referring so you see like a snowflake chain of, of data tables and this just you don't need to under you know spend much time on this but it just shows you how it's much more broken down into break it down break it down break it in and break it down but when when we're talking in power bi we're talking about normalization to the first order so that's what they're referring to each table is like a subject an entity so we could have products we could have location we could have customers we could have date and they have repeating attributes on them apart from the one index but in database terminology it's broken down much further so here a traditional database is a row storage so we have date store product customer price Whereas Power BI and um, no, don't don't do it, Arvind. You don't need to. Not in Power BI. This bit will explain why. So in a column-based database, which is Vertipack Engine, the engine inside Power BI and Excel um, Power Pivot is a column-based database, and it works on columns. So it breaks up your tables and it automatically does the 3NF for you. So we have an it, it's it's a column based database and it's called Vertipack. So every single column that you have within your table is broken down into columns. And if you follow Kerbal, look on Kerbal, she's got a really nice few clips on um, Vertipack engine. So what happens is, and this goes back to the direct in import, Vertipack Engine works in import mode. So when we pull our data into Power BI, we're importing it. That data sits in a version of analysis services database within the actual PBIX. So when we're talking about sharing PBIX, is you're actually sharing the data, unless you save it as a PBIT template, which will just show you, say, the top level. But if you're sharing a PBIX, you're sharing the data that is stored within it. So that data is stored and imported into Power BI. And the reason is that it's so quick is the Vertipack engine that sits inside Power BI compresses each column. So it looks at each column and it compresses the data within it and it works out the position of each row within that column. It establishes relationships and then it basically handles the process for you. I've got a little diagram which shows it. So on here, so if we take, for example, our quarter column, we've got quarter one, quarter one, quarter one, quarter one, quarter two. Then what Power BI does, it says, right, well, OK, there's only four values, quarter one to quarter four. So I'm just going to call them a number, 0123. And so if this was January, February, March, April, it would go to 12. Now, because it's only using one digit, 0123, what it can say is there's only four values. So because there's only four values, I only need to use two bits of data. So um, what that actually means is as you store data, it goes up in um, in uh, base two. So because there's only two bits used, only four values, the two bits used. So that makes it really, really efficient in compressing it down to the amount of data that needs to be stored to hold the data that you have. And then to make it even better, it uses this thing called run length encoding. So it will say, well, OK, I've got this dictionary value, zero equals quarter one. Well, I don't need to store 310 rows of quarter one. I can just say for 310 rows, I've got zero. 
So for 290, I've got one. So 425, I've got two. And 350, I've got three. So it compresses this data of what's that, five, six hundred, a thousand, twenty-five, nearly 1,400 rows into four columns, four rows, two columns. And that's what makes it so efficient when you import the data in. But what it does is it works out the order, and I don't quite know how it works out the order for which column to compress. And I think that's a Microsoft thing. That's really, really, really complex. So, but that's how it does the compressing. And that's why it's really important to have your data as one type. And, and the worst thing for Power BI is bringing in loads and loads of descriptive text because it can't compress it. So that's the thing that bloats out your model as well. Any questions at that bit? No? Um, um, uh, does that mean when we load it as a directory and we share the dashboard, the end user won't be able to see the license? Um, I don't know, to be honest. They should be able to see it, but that's a bit more, uh, that's a bit more specific, uh, Tina, and I've got about five minutes before I finish. So, um, Basically, so why do we why do we have um, data types and why is it important? Because Power BI works by filtering, grouping, and then creating expressions. So the, the optimal steps to be able to achieve compression have a star schema. So you have your dimensions, you have your fact tables, and you have it set up in a really nice star schema which filters down. Only bring in what you need. Just because you can bring in every single row and column of data, don't. Only bring in what you need because you can always go back and grab it if you need it, but it's more difficult to take it out if you've given people access to it. And the more you give them access to, the more you have to manage. So it's easier and better to start off and bring in exactly what you need because you can always go and get it. Um, there was some discussion in the chat about when to do the transformations. If you've got a, an IT team with a brilliant database, I was asked them to do the transformations upstream. So it, it just means whilst I can do it in Power Query, it's better if the data is fixed as far upstream as possible, because then when it feeds every single one of my Power BI reports, it's right from the data. So you push your transformations for your data as far upstream as possible. Um, be efficient with your data types and your columns. If you've got a whole number that you're bringing in, call it a whole number, because if you call it a decimal, Power BI has to allow for the fact there could be decimals, whereas, yeah, as far upstream as possible. Whereas if you've got a whole number, it knows it stops. So it can actually be more efficient with the way that it stores the data. Optimise your DAX. So, I mean, that's that's a whole course in itself for days and days. Um, Optimising your DAX is think about what you're asking it to do. So it's about um, not putting iterators within calculated columns. It's, it's thinking about what the DAX does and, and what you want it to do. Although, to be fair, Power BI is quite a beast in, in actually making things happen. Apply your filters on your column. So if you're using your DAX, make sure you filter the column. And when it's good enough, stop. You can go on and on and on. Um, but generally, it, it's it's pretty fast on its own. Uh, I think I'm about to. Oh, look at that good timing. So hopefully, what you've achieved is you've understood what the key basic concepts are behind different types of data. Um, you understand what the importance of data types are. Um, for the different things that you can do. Um, you've learned how to effectively model data within Power BI, so you understand the importance of um, star schemas, both for the filtering, the grouping and the aggregating, and, um, and for speed as well. Um, and you've understood, I hope, just I've touched on a little bit about what's meant by normalised data. Um, why a star schema is important, because then you can have your, your different dimensions, filtering different fact tables, and you'll be able to compare budget with, with sales and forecast, because you're comparing like with like with your dimensions. Um, 
We've touched a little bit about how the engine works, how VertiPax works, um, and I think that's it. Any questions? Thank you, you have um, Anthony, I've worked as a university lecturer for years before um, setting up my own business five, six years ago. So um, I've had teenagers for uh, students and if they're bored, they get the phones out. So I find it much easier. <laughs> thank you. But thank you, Anthony. Can you show that where your filter expression is mentioned? Yeah. yeah. This one. Yeah, team training. If they're bored, they just switch off. They're not they're not polite about it. Um, so on here within Power BI, your dimension tables filter your fact table. You then group it. So if we're if we're filtering by, I don't know, if we're filtering by year being 2022, we might then group by country. And then what we do is we create our DAX expression to actually say, well, tell me of those um, of those countries in 2022, what was the total unit cost? So you filter, then you group, and then you and then you aggregate. So I think that was it. It's all it's okay. Um, but I, you know, it's it's it's. Thank you. It's. Um, it's a massive, massive topic, so you need to take on board this and then you just continually, continually, always, always training. So I, I taught myself all of this and there's so many resources out there and lots of free resources like today's Power BI community, um, lots and lots of sessions. And, um, and I think someone said earlier, you know, we all make mistakes. So, um, yeah. Any questions? Thank you, Sue. Fantastic feedback from the whole audience there. Um, so really, really appreciate your session today. You shared a lot of great tips. Um, so that's really, really helpful. You've answered everyone's questions I can see in the chat there. So I just yeah. want to thank you once again, Sue. Um, I would also like you to share your contact details and your and your blog as well so that the community yeah. can keep in touch with you. Yeah, no, no worries. I'm quite active on um very active twitter I, I use more for sort of like gossipy you know gossipy sessions linkedin is much more um much more professional um but what i'll do is i'll share this with you um i do work for enterprise dna um and power query the power query course that i showed is um is just absolutely brilliant for melissa because if you're doing lots and lots of of data cleaning then you know it, it's a really good thing so um that's my website my twitter i'm at sue underscore bays you'd learn so much from twitter um and my linkedin is here but I learn loads from Twitter, all sorts of com and just get involved in all of the community challenges and, and things. But I'll pop, I'll I'll give you this um RAS, which is my um Power BI model, so that people can have a look at it. Thank you, Sue. What a great pleasure. Um so once yeah. again, huge round of applause to Sue, everybody. And I'm sure we will be seeing you hopefully at an in-person conference uh, in the yes. near future. Yes, I went to Sequel Bits this year and it was just amazing. It was lovely. But it's just so great to see so much engagement within the community and people chatting because you're sat in a room on your own and you're thinking, is anyone listening? Has my son gone down? But yeah, and I'm very pleased my dog hasn't barked as well because he's a bit loud. So he's been very good today. Wow, well, we're around the Christian. Yes, make, you make oh, nice some lovely friends. Nice to meet you, Christian, too, yeah. Thank you so much yeah. again, Sue. Take no care. No worries. Take care. Have a nice rest of the day, everyone. Thank Bye. you. I made the power Bye. BI with you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Love that, Raz.